if there was an illness to get, he got. He didn't sleep through the night. You know, he cried easily, difficult to soothe. Projectile vomiting, you know, this was a difficult <laughs> child. Now, the importance of this is that temperament is not destiny, but it sets the terms of engagement. The classic research by Thomas and Chess pointed out, for example, that among temperamentally easy babies, only 10% had significant adjustment problems by elementary school. If you're the parent of an easy baby, an easy child, life looks good. You wake up every morning thinking, what new evidence of my competence and success will I see today? Oh good, it's teacher conference day. I love teacher conference day. Mrs. Jones, it's such a pleasure having your child in my class. Thank you, That's because I'm such a good parent. Among difficult babies, 70% had significant adjustment problems by elementary school. If you're the parent of a difficult child, life looks very different. It's more like waking up, what is it going to be today? You know, oh my God, it's teacher conference day. Mrs. Jones, I want to talk to you about your son. <laughs> oh God. Well, the point is, not that temperament is destiny, but it sets the terms of engagement. And the more recent work on temperament really reflects that. Stanley Greenspan wrote a book called The Challenging Child, which is about different packages of temperaments which are challenging. And he tells you how to succeed with each. That you're not passive and helpless in the face of these challenges, you can adapt. My difficult baby is now a pretty successful 24-year-old young man. If you get to know him, you can still see the temperamental <coughs> themes are there. He still is not a happy-go-lucky 24-year-old. He takes things very hard. He takes a lot of kind of, you know, keeping afloat. You know, he hurt his foot last year. For three months, you, had, you would think the world had come to an end. His sister had surgery on her arm and didn't tell me about it for two days. <laughs> I mean, this, so you see these, you know, compensations, but the point is you can get through the challenge. Because some kids may be so difficult that any normal person will fail with them. Ross Green has a book called The, uh, the Explosive Child about children who are so temperamentally difficult that almost any normal family cannot manage them effectively. And these kids disproportionately end up in residential facilities because they drive people crazy. Because the world is so aversive to them, they have a terrible time getting through the day. Now, temperament may even play a part in, in violence and aggression. Not that there's some inborn trait for aggression, but certain temperamental packages may make you more fertile ground for learning aggression if your culture teaches you to. For example, some kids, particularly boys, are inclined to what is called rough and tumble play. Now, rough and tumble play is not aggression. It's a kind of an affinity for crashing into things. Put a bunch of little boys here and a bunch of little girls there, and by and large, what will happen is as we go about our business, pretty soon the boys start rocking in their chairs and somebody will crash over backwards, they'll knock the water over. This is not aggression, but this kind of affinity for rough and tumble play is a much more fertile climate in which to learn aggression if your culture teaches you. By adolescence, what may have been a small difference is now magnified. You know, put a bunch of high school boys over here and a bunch of high school girls over there and let's bring in a coach. Coach says, all right, who'd like to run into that wall? <laughs> Most of the boys say, yep, coach, I'm ready. I'm ready. To, let me at that wall. <laughs> Most of the girls sit there thinking, why would somebody want to run into a wall? <clears throat> now, this is not to say that all the boys want to run into the wall. Some boys are thinking, ooh, running into the wall. I don't want to do that. But the culture may make them say, all right, but I better raise my hand because people don't want to think I'm a wimp or a pussy. And some of the girls are thinking, yeah, mm, I'd love to run into that wall, but it wouldn't be ladylike. <laughs> of course, one sort of progress we've made culturally is now some of those girls can say, yeah, let me at that wall, coach. And some of the boys can say, no, thank you. And it won't be as stigmatized as it was 40 years ago. But that may also be one reason why we are seeing a significant increase in seriously violent behavior by girls. Those victimized, angry, full of rage girls are now much more empowered and enabled to act out in a way that they weren't 40 years ago. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So temperament, understanding this is important. You know what is very important in understanding? Somebody like Dylan Klebold, one of the school shooters in Littleton, Colorado. Now, it's pretty easy. People don't have a hard time seeing why some kid who was mercilessly abused and tortured, was deprived and exploited and rejected, becomes so angry he becomes an aggressive, violent kid. 
And probably 90% of kids who kill, certainly 90% of the kids I interview in prisons or in courtrooms, are like that. You know, they're mad as hell at the world early on, and you're not surprised why. One of these kids once said to me, he says, at age eight, I went to war against the world. And now at 15, I'm sitting there interviewing him. He's committed a double murder. But what about the 10% of kids who don't come from this background of abuse and deprivation and rejection and all that, who come from nice families, good parents? Somebody like Dylan Klebold. The only way that I can begin to understand this, and I don't claim to understand it fully, I don't think anybody does, <coughs> is that these are very sensitive, temperamentally, temperamentally vulnerable kids who are growing up in very supportive families. A boy like Dylan, I mean, I know his parents. They're, they're wonderful people. They're loving, kind, concerned, involved, intelligent people. But they had this very, very sensitive, vulnerable kid who, in effect, they came up, kept afloat all those years through their Herculean efforts to be wonderful parents. It's like they give him a little life jacket that keeps him afloat all through childhood. But in adolescence, when he gets sort of on his own out there, he can't take it. He can't take the bullying in school. He can't take the difficulty. He can't take the poisonous culture. And he succumbs to it, and his sensitivity and vulnerability become this warped person. And, in his case, he's so clever he can keep it secret from his parents, a kind of secret life. Think of it this way. I almost guarantee that if Dylan Klebold had been born to a poor, single-parent, minority parent living in an inner-city housing project, you would have seen the damage by the time he was five like most of these kids who end up as killers. You would have seen by five or six that he was in deep trouble, but he was kept afloat. So temperament is very important in all of this. The last concept I'll introduce is the concept of spirituality. The idea that we need to understand that human beings are not simply animals with complicated brains, that we are spiritual beings and we have spiritual needs. And we know human beings have physical needs, if you don't meet some of these physical needs, you get warped physical development. Uh, if you don't give them the vitamins or the calories they need, you get distortions of physical development. We know that children have psychological needs. For example, the need for acceptance. An anthropologist named Ronald Rohner studied rejection in 118 cultures around the world. He found in every culture, kids who are rejected turn out badly. So much so that he called rejection a psychological malignancy a psychological cancer. And this is universal. So he's saying it's a fundamental psychological need to be accepted. And if you don't get accepted, you get warped. Well, I think the, the third part of that is that human beings have spiritual needs. We have a need to have a sense that we live in a meaningful universe and that we participate in that. And there's something more than just getting up, going to the mall, going to the bathroom, eating and going to bed. That there is a dimension to human experience beyond that. I would say of all the things that I've observed in kids I've interviewed who have been killers, spiritual emptiness is maybe the most common. And spiritual emptiness in this social context that we live in is particularly dangerous. Why? Well, for three reasons. One, a spiritually empty kid has a kind of hole in his heart. He craves some meaning, and if you can't have the spiritual positive meaning, you'll take the dark side of the culture instead. A study in Texas found that 15% of the kids in Texas prisons said that Satanism was their structure of meaning. If you're out there with a hole in your heart, nature abhors a vacuum and Marilyn Manson is ready to step in. And there's a tremendous cultural issue here about the dark side of the culture giving meaning, albeit demonic and negative, to kids who are otherwise sort of struggling to find some meaning. A lot of the school shooters you know, have Marilyn Manson lyrics on their wall, they wear Marilyn Manson rings, they've got Marilyn Manson t-shirts. This is their structure of meaning. Demonic but true. A guy once said to a friend of mine in prison, I'd rather be wanted for murder than not be wanted at all. And there's a lot of truth to that too. Everybody's got to have something. The second reason why spiritual emptiness is so dangerous in our context is that a spiritually empty kid doesn't naturally come to a sense of limits. Whereas a spiritually grounded kid is much more likely to have a sort of, sort of practical reverence for life in the sense of there's more than just you and me here to, you know, to contend with in making decisions. Whereas a spiritually empty kid says it's you and me. You make me angry, you deserve to die. 
one of the British observers of the American school shooters said they have what she called deadly petulance. Deadly petulance in the sense of, how dare you make me feel this way? You deserve to die. Not just you, but the whole school deserves to die. Whereas a spiritually grounded kid can say, you know, I feel really angry, but, it, but there are things you don't do because it would violate this kind of ethic, this universal ethic. The third reason is a spiritually grounded kid has a kind of emotional place to stand when he gets sad. A spiritually empty kid can go into emotional free fall. A spiritually grounded kid can say, I may feel personally lousy, but at least I know I live in a meaningful universe. A spiritually empty kid says, I feel lousy, that's all there is, is how I feel. And down you go. So research by Andrew Weaver and others has shown that kids who are involved in spiritually positive activities of a religious or some other nature are indeed to some degree buffered from social pathologies that we're concerned about. This of course is a very tough issue for us as a culture because it has all kinds of overtones and questions and uh, uh, is it sure to provoke debate of various types. But I think that you can look around and say that there are so many ways in which the sort of shallow materialistic culture that we surround kids with does them a disservice. It doesn't give them the depth they need to anchor themselves through, through difficulties. A guy named Bert Kohler at the University of Chicago in some of his research studies basically this question. Why do some people with lousy early lives develop good later lives while other people with lousy early lives develop lousy later lives? And he says it's mainly because some kids, some people, develop a story of their life that gives meaning to their lousy early life and transforms that meaning into something positive. So you always want to ask, what are the cultural resources kids have to make sense of their life and to give direction to it? I was on a talk show this fall, a Queen Latifah talk show. And you probably know Queen Latifah is a big hip-hop figure, lovely person. The other guest that day was LL Cool J, an even bigger hip-hop figure. Now, LL Cool J is kind of your, you know, his public persona is your classic kind of thug, you know. But he's actually a very bright, articulate guy. He used the word epiphany correctly in talking that day. I was very impressed. But he said something that I thought was just 100% wrong. He says, well, I say to the kids, you know, keep the violence on the CD, not in the streets. But it doesn't work that way. Particularly for vulnerable, meaning-hungry kids. It doesn't work that way. It becomes, uh, you know, an explanation for life. It infects and contaminates and poisons. And of course, all the dark side of the culture does that, particularly when kids need some kind of deeper, more substantial resources to draw upon. I met a woman once who told me when she was 14, she was within three days of killing herself. She said her life seemed totally worthless. She had been sexually abused. She was physically disabled. She had bad skin, she was poor, you know, she said she was stupid. She was ready to kill herself. And then her librarian gave her a copy of Harriet Tubman's biography. She says, I read this book, and here's this woman whose life was even crappier than mine. But she made something of herself. So she said, that gave me a concrete idea of how to become a bigger, better person. And now, 25 years later, she was a, a large person in every spiritual sense of the word. When I go and talk with guys who've been sentenced to life imprisonment or on death row, it's pretty clear they, fall t they tend to fall into two groups. They either become savages and barbarians, or they become monks. Basically the two paths. The guys who say, I may be physically in prison, but my spiritual and intellectual life is not over, are the ones who become large human beings. The ones who say, I'm never going to the mall again, become savage barbarians. I interviewed one guy who was on death row. The whole conversation was about Plato. This is a kid who probably had never read a book till he was 19 in prison, but somehow got hooked up with Plato's Republic, and we had this long discussion, those of you who know your Plato, about the allegory of the cave. Somebody remember this? You know, with the shadows and what is real. And This really opened up his eyes to life. Okay. What a shame it has to wait till he's on death row for a murder committed when he's 19. But it speaks to the fact that we're not doing enough to enrich the deep culture of kids. Most of the television we show and watch you know, is so shallow in its cultural resources. The music often is, the, the reading is, and it's, 
It's tolerable if your life is okay and you don't have many risk factors. But if you start loading up the risk factors, the importance of these deep cultural resources grows and grows and grows, and it may be the, literally the difference between life and death. So you put all this together, is what I've tried to do in Lost Boys, to try to understand how it is that boys get lost to themselves and to us, the role of trauma in their lives, the role of overwhelming accumulation of risk, the role of vulnerable, sensitive temperaments that can't take it. One of my students, Ellen Delara, did a study of school safety. and She said teenagers in high school identified for her as one of the single most important attributes for getting through school was the ability to take it, by which they meant that you can go to school and, you know, and if bad things happen or people bully you, you get rejected, whatever it is, that you can take it without losing it. And kids like Dylan are deficient in their ability to take it temperamentally, and in this kind of culture it makes it very dangerous. So I go back to where we started. That all of these individual developmental pathways and trends take their significance in the larger culture. That if Dylan and Eric had been growing up in Canada, they would have still been troubled, angry, sensitive boys, but I'm almost sure they wouldn't have been killers. If they had been growing up in my high school 35 years ago, they would have been troubled, angry, weird kids, but they would not have been killers. And that really imposes upon us the importance of saying that all that we do individually with kids as parents or as teachers or some other kind of professional always has to be complemented and augmented by what we do as citizens in taking care of the larger culture, its quality, its depth, its spiritual grounding. Thank you. All right, brave, hearty souls, we have some time for questions and feeble attempts at answers before the cookies lure us over there. Have I bludgeoned you into silence, or are there questions? Yes, sir. Detailed question, you mentioned the ability to take it. Her name is Ellen DeLara, D-E-L-A-R-A. She's at Cornell University, actually in the same address as mine, the Family Life Development Center. If you have any trouble reaching her, reach me, and I'll put you in touch. It's not published yet. Very, very interesting stuff. You know, one of the things I neglected to mention that slipped my mind is, I think it's kind of a fascinating thing, is the pivotal role of first grade teachers in this whole process. The research of Shepard Kellum at John Hopkins University showed that if an aggressive boy walks into first grade and finds a weak teacher who allows a chaotic classroom, by sixth grade, that boy can be 20 times more aggressive than if he had walked into first grade and found a strong teacher who created an orderly classroom. Because Kellum found that in the weak teacher's room, the aggressive boys form into aggressive peer groups and they reinforce and support and exaggerate each other's aggressive behavior and this momentum builds up. Whereas in the, weak, in the strong teacher's room, that doesn't happen. So he developed an intervention called the good behavior game for first grade teachers to take charge of that process. And research shows that if they do it in first grade, the aggressive boys are much less aggressive by sixth grade than they would have been without it. It always makes me think of my early elementary school teacher, Mrs. Carey. See, I was a very aggressive little boy. When I was three, people used to knock on my mother's door and complain I was beating up their six-year-olds. I was kind of an overachiever, you know, sort of back then. But Mrs. Carey sort of put a stop to that. You know, Mrs. Carey was this big, imposing woman, you know, who was so loving and caring and powerful. You know, she said, welcome to my class. I'm here to teach you, to educate you, to civilize you, to love you. But remember, I'm in charge here. Remember Mrs. Carey, big lady, big hairy arms, and a big wart on her head, and a giant bosom. And Mrs. Carey would hug you. It was truly an ambivalent experience. <laughs> but boy, none of that aggressive peer group stuff in her room. But it's, it's fascinating how pivotal that can be. And you know, there's a concept for that. Uh, my mentor, Yuri Bonferman, used to call these developmental windows of opportunity. That there are points at which you know, things are up for grabs developmentally, and if you act then, you know, these ecological transitions, as he called them, like first grade is one, like having your first child is another. That's why these times are so pivotal in the intervention process. Yes, sir? Are you really saying that all these problems of boys are in their parents? Well, you know, aren't I really saying all these problems are boys and their parents? I would say no. I would say the problems are... You know, I was on a panel recently and somebody said, who would you point the finger of blame at? 
And I said, well, the accumulation of risk model tells us that no single factor by itself is pretty important, so you need a whole handful of fingers and probably save one for yourself, because almost all of us in some way contribute to this. No, I would say, for example, um, you know, as I said, temperament plays a role. You get an easy child, the task of being a parent is pretty easy. You get a very difficult child. If you get an impossible child in Ross Green's turn, most any parent's going to fail with them. Uh, there's the pro so there's temperament. There is uh, there is the social poisons around that affect the consequence. The American Psychological Association, for example, looked at all the research on TV and says that based on the research, TV accounts for about 10% of aggressive behavior by itself. Now, is that a big effect? It's about as big an effect as smoking on cancer. Now, smoking accounts for about 10% of the variation in cancer rate. Well, smoking, quote, causes cancer. TV causes aggressive behavior. But no effect is big, and the effect of parents is significant, but, but variable. In some situations, it's more salient than others. A parent who abuses and beats and rejects and deprives a child, you could say, yeah, there's a pretty clear case that that parent is dramatically increasing the risk of producing a violent, troubled kid. But most parents don't do that. What parents may do is they may be inept in responding to challenging children, but a survey showed recently that one in four American parents in the survey said they have at least one child at home who is so difficult it makes it impossible to lead a normal life. So that's an awful lot of parents. So we have a new book coming out in September called Parents Under Siege, which is sort of about that, the, the challenge of raising difficult children in this socially poisoned world that we live in. And the socially poisoned world is, is a big part of it. You know, those, I mean, you, most a lot of you are too young to have appreciation for some of this, but, you know, there was a time when parents didn't say, I better check my child's room because he could be building bombs off the internet. <laughs> I mean, there was a time when, even as a teenager, if you provoked the most aggressive kid in your school, it wouldn't occur to you he would shoot you. I mean, these are, these are changes in the social environment that dramatically affect the, um, the task that parents face. So I would say, no, I'm not saying it's all laying in the parents. It depends, you know, what the parents are doing and what else is going on. If you've got an easy child living in a socially healthy, benign community and you still turn out a problem, well, maybe you're really doing something wrong. There's a book, you know, it came out last couple of years ago by Judith Harris uh, called The Nurture Assumption that really marshals the evidence. Her point was that parents don't matter much at all. That if you look at the research, it's basically, you know, what parents do has very little effect on things like uh, smoking, drinking, uh, all the rest of it. Her view was that it was almost entirely peers and temperamental sort of biological things. If, if you're interested in that, by the way, there was a very effective sort of realistic, reasonable rebuttal to that published in The American Psychologist. Uh, February 2000, the first author is Andrew Collins, University of Minnesota, called The Case for Nature and Nurture. And they point out that, you know, simple models overestimate the influence of parents, but that uh, Judith Harris underestimates the influence of parents. And that in certain contexts, for certain variables, the influence is very large. For others, it's much smaller. And... Um, uh, it's pretty complicated. Yeah. Well, you know, some of those kids, by that far, if they're that seriously afflicted, you know, residential programs may be the only way to stabilize it because there's too many things going on at once. And, and so that may be one thing. There are intervention strategies that one is called multisystemic therapy, which is very effective even with older kids where you have these seemingly insurmountable problems. But in multisystemic therapy, you work with the parents, the kid, the neighbors, the relatives, the teacher at school, the kids in the neighborhood. So you mobilize the whole environment to try to redirect the kid. Uh, therapeutic foster care, 
sometimes can have some of that effect because you kind of isolate the kid from those influences with two trained, highly motivated foster parents who really, you know, have a team of people to work on. So uh, the longer you wait, the harder it gets. The more multiple the kid's uh, problems are, the more difficult it gets. I think um, people often, in a sense, wait too long. And this, uh, I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned before, but kids who by age 8 or 10 have developed this chronic pattern of aggression, bad behavior, acting out, and violating the rights of others. You know, if a psychiatrist sees them, they'll be diagnosed as having conduct disorder. And that's a real heavy load. About 30% of kids who have that diagnosed by age 10 end up as serious violent delinquents. But even there, in some neighborhoods, it's only 15% become serious violent delinquents. In other neighborhoods, it's 60%. The context has an awful lot to do with what the outcome of that will be. Now, dealing with those kids gets more and more difficult the older they get. Prior to age eight, it's still much more malleable, and through changing what the parents do and the contingencies between parents, getting the teachers on board, you can often redirect, unless it's really being driven by a very strong internal temperamental sensitivity or vulnerability. Uh, then it may require a much more elaborate strategy. There may be medications to help the child cope with some of the overwhelming nature of the world. I think, I think it's Green, Greenspan who puts it this way. You know that most everybody reacts to, you know the, the experience you feel when somebody rubs their fingernails on a blackboard? That makes you grimace. Some children, their nervous systems are set up in such a way that that's what life is like basically 24 hours a day. And you can see what a challenge it would be to raise such a child as well as to be such a child. The other part of your question was how do they come back eventually? I would say you know, the basic sort of slogan would be consciousness trumps develop. That you can develop a level of consciousness which can overcome all kinds of things. Well, I think it's one of the most disturbing areas of all child development is this kind of attachment deficit disorder. Kids don't seem to get it at all about what what consciousness is about. And, uh, Bowlby, the British psychiatrist, has this story, it's mentioned in Lost Boys, that he was once seeing a boy like that at home, in his sort of his study at home, and he was called out of the room for a minute and then remembered he'd left his cat in the room with this boy. So he rushed back to find the boy had thrown the cat in the fire. Not in a sense maliciously, but much the way just sort of experimentally. Oh, what's it like if you throw a cat in the fire? As a kid might say, what happens if you throw cellophane in the fire? That the kid just didn't sort of get it that this is a being as opposed to an object. And that's such a profound kind of lack of consciousness that no wonder it takes, you know, if ever it gets recovered, it takes long periods of time and drives people crazy and is so horrible and dangerous because it's that fundamental. It's like being consciousness blind or something. But, you know, blindness is a disability that people can find ways to work around. You know, you can get a Helen Keller out of it. So I think we have to be, you know, realistic but not pessimistic. Um, you know, optimism is one of the only things we have going for us. <laughs> and it transcends an awful lot of factual reality sometimes. Actually, it's interesting, you know, uh, one of the, I think, very interesting studies on what gets abused kids into this conduct disorder pattern. This research done uh, that, that shows that, uh, Kenneth Dodge did this research, that about 35% of abused kids end up with conduct disorder. But the ones who do are characterized by four sort of social maps, four consciousness things. One, they tend to be oblivious to positive social cues. In most social situations, there's positive and negative emotional information. Most of us sort of see both, and that keeps us anchored in the middle. She's smiling, she's frowning. This one's warm, this one's cold. And you see both, and it keeps you anchored. These kids don't see the positive and are hypersensitive to the negative. So you can see how that pushes them to a more and more consistently negative view of the world. There are some of us who are kind of Pollyannas, who only see the positive. This is how I get through the day. <laughs> I just block out all the negative stuff. I only see the positive. I count on my wife to see the negative stuff and let me know about it. But these kids only see the negative. Three, they have developed a repertoire of behaviors which is loaded up almost exclusively to aggression. That when frustrated, challenged, afraid, angry, whatever it is, the only tool they have is aggression. 
It's like they have a road map that only has north on it. Imagine we're sitting here, we're in Ames, Iowa tonight. We're in Ames, and if we said, what, you know, what direction do we go to get to, gosh, what's north of Iowa, Minnesota? <laughs> what direction, north, we go to Minnesota, north, okay. But this kid, you say, what direction would you go to get to Nebraska? And he goes, north. And what direction would you go to get Texas? He goes, north. And what direction to go to Ohio? He goes, north. To the point is only one direction, aggression. And the fourth thing that Dodge found that differentiated these kids was they have developed the conclusion that aggression is successful in social situations. They've observed that this works. And you know, so this is how, you know, an early risk of abuse gets translated into a later serious problem. Because if you're abused and you don't develop those four ways of looking at the world, you're at no greater risk of conduct disorder than non-abused kids. And of course it leads to a natural pathway for intervention. What you've got to do with abused kids is help them see the positive, uh, show them their alternatives to aggression, and don't let aggression succeed more than most any other kid. You took Joey's lunch, you punched him in the stomach, you give it back. Aggression will not succeed here. Now, these are much more malleable than, you know, this attachment deficit you're talking about, which may be so profound that um, I mean, the, the positive outcome might be if they become autistic. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that New Yorker article about that woman, she's, a, she's on a faculty somewhere and she's autistic. And she has a PhD, but she says, you know, she has consciousness of it, she says, I don't get it, you know. Like, like um, those of you who watch uh, Star Trek, you know, what's his name, the, uh, uh, the, the android? Data. Data, you know, data is, is like this. He doesn't get it. And he's formed an intellectual idea about friendship and stuff, but he doesn't feel it. And maybe some of these kids can develop, you know, with awful lot of intervention, a sort of intellectual idea about attachment. This is what I would do if I felt attachment. I think one more and then we got to stop. Yeah. You know, several researchers here at Iowa State have done kind of their work in the area of uh, media violence, video game violence, and that kind of story. Um, and I can, like, from what you said tonight, it seems like that's just another risk factor that would pile on these kids. My question is that in your work with uh, some of these more mature aggressive individuals, uh, younger generation of aggressive individuals, do you see a A very good question. I think one of the distinct elements of social toxicity we're facing is this changed quality of the media environment for kids. That the imagery is much more intense and thus potentially one much more traumatic. Dorothy Cantor has a book out, uh, this sort of follow-up study of the effects of traumatic movie experiences on adults, of childhood experiences. Uh, the effect of Jaws and some of these other things, which are almost mild by contemporary standards. And there's a growing sense that these things are capable of traumatizing kids. My first real exposure with that part of it was when I went to Kuwait at the end of the Gulf War for the United Nations. I was interviewing kids who had witnessed atrocities, and they were experiencing trauma. A year later, a follow-up study found a whole group of Kuwaiti children showing symptoms of trauma who hadn't been in Kuwait during the war. What had happened was after the war, the Kuwaiti government was showing videotapes of Iraqi atrocities as political education. And it turned out it was kicking off traumatic responses in these kids. So when I came back to Chicago from that visit and started seeing kids who were showing signs of trauma from watching you know, Friday the 13th and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, I was realizing this is what you can do when you provide the full sensory array the videotape can do. So that's part of it, and that is traumatic and desensitizing and corrupting. And for kids who are headed down a dark pathway, it becomes a vehicle for solidifying their dark pathway. The second element is to point out what you say, the first person video games. Now the history to that is, is really kind of disturbing. Throughout history, the biggest problem armies have always faced is that most soldiers won't try to kill the enemy. Uh, over and over again, the studies show you send an army into battle, you say fire at the enemy, and 80% of the soldiers won't do it. They pretend to shoot at the enemy, they shoot in the ground, they shoot above them, they go bang, they don't really have bullets in their guns. Why? Because they carry with them an inhibition about killing. 
that learning to shoot at a target does not break down. So when the military discovered that, they changed the training from shooting at targets to shooting at human forms. And by now, 90% of soldiers can go in and shoot at the enemy first time out. It used to be 20%, now it's 90%. Remember the war in the Falklands, the British and the Argentinians? The British, British beat the crap out of the Argentinians on the battlefield. One reason it turned out was the British soldiers had the modern training, so 90% of them were shooting at the Argentinians. The Argentinians had the old-fashioned training, only 20% were shooting back. Well, what turns out to be the most efficient technology for doing that is the point-and-shoot video game, which is why the military buys it. It, it. There's something about the repetition of this physical act of holding the weapon, shooting at the human form or any form on the screen that breaks down the inhibition and trains you up to kill. It doesn't make you kill, but it liberates you to kill. So that's why the case of Michael Carneal in West Paducah has gotten so much attention. Kid buys a pit, steals a pistol, practices one afternoon, walks into his school, fires eight times, hits eight kids, five of them in the head or the upper chest. Now, if you've never fired a pistol, you probably don't appreciate how amazing this is. I was talking with a police chief about this. He said, well, in our police force, we tell our officers, if you hit somebody 20% of the time, that's adequate. Or think about the Diallo case in New York City. Five police officers open up against one unarmed guy at close range. They fire 41 times and hit him 19 times. This 15-year-old kid, with one day of practice in the pistol, walks in and goes eight for eight, five of them in the head or the upper chest. And the way he did it was very counterintuitive. The natural way to kill people when you shoot them is to keep firing at them until they fall over. He didn't do that, one bullet per person. The natural thing is to you know, fire in a frenzy. He didn't do that, very methodical. How did he get so good? Thousands of hours of practice on a point-and-shoot video game, which trained him emotionally, physiologically, how to do this. Now the point isn't that the game makes you a killer, because almost every kid who plays this game will never become a killer, but the point is it gets you ready. I was talking with Colin Powell about this recently. He was saying, look, in the army, you say, we know when we train the soldiers like that, we've created a vulnerability. So in return, we compensate by teaching them a chain of command, a structure of authority, an ethic about the use of your weapon. These kids are getting the liberation from the inhibition without the compensating factor. And the compensating factor would be quite powerful. You know, American soldiers in Vietnam who came back had lower homicide rates than men who didn't serve. In part because although they, they committed suicide in high rates, some of them, they did all kinds of things, but the, the discipline about the use of the weapon stuck with them. And these kids don't have that. And it's very, very scary because it's like saying, all right, How's this for a social intervention? Let's get you know every teenage boy in America ready to kill somebody if he wants to. Why would you do that? Well, people make money on it, and it's fun. It is fun if you're a boy. I mean, I tried playing Area 51 a couple of times. This is great fun, but I won't do it because I don't want to take the cost of disinhibiting that. But you know that's easy for a decrepit old 54-year-old guy to say. But a 16-year-old kid, we need to protect them from it. So that, coupled with the TV, coupled with the media violence, coupled with the record violence, all of this creates a vulnerability and put it in the hands of psychologically vulnerable kids and then make guns available, you know, why are we surprised this is a problem? <laughs> it's amazing there isn't more of it. All right, that was the last, I was told that was the last question. I've got to get to Des Moines eventually here. We've got a reception here with Punch 